Amen and amen. Okay, so if I can get the rest of the lights turned on here this morning, that'd be great. This is part two. Now listen, I've, so far I've got, uh, I, I preached the introduction out of, uh, of uh, Ezekiel 37 about reviving the dry bones uh, where uh, God began a restoration process in the lives of his people. And what I'm going to do this morning is the second part of a six-part series. Uh, what you will re- re- realize if you are, are pretty good at remembering what was taught last week, I, I tend to think I don't remember what I taught last week. I'm surprised if you do that I'm going to do a, 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 about a third of the message this morning is a recap of last week, just kind of the introduction, and then we're going to get into the rest of what we want to learn this week. But in Ezra chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, the Word of God says, After these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, and we'll just, there was a bunch of names there. We'll jump down to verse 6. Ezra came up from Babylon, and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, with the Lord God, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king granted Ezra all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. They're coming from Babylon back to the land of Israel. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. On the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. So kind of a background of this. The descendants of Abraham eventually became the nation of Israel. That's who we're looking at here, the people of God. Through them, God was working to bring forth a people who would, in covenant with him, reflect, as we said before, the nature of God, the values of God, and bring the purposes of God to bear in the earth. That has not changed. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How does that happen? Through God's people, which are you and I. Throughout the centuries, getting back to Israel, these people of God would cycle through times of great devotion and victory to times of rebellion, idolatry, and defeat. Just think back to when Moses delivered them out of Egypt, great victory, they're in the desert, and all of a sudden, complaining, griping, and great problems, right? So across their history, we see that God delivered them out of their captivity in Egypt, eventually brought them into the promise of that land. Over a process of centuries, he established through them a place of worship in that land, eventually built up the city of Jerusalem from where they were to govern and bring God's will to bear in the earth. Unfortunately, as we already said before, through their history, there was a repetitive cycle of rebellion and idolatry. In his mercy, God continued to send his prophets to call them back to himself. Unfortunately, as a result of their continued callousness and rebellion towards God, they ultimately found themselves captive to the nation of Babylon. The walls of the city that were built, uh, that had been built up, were now torn down. The temple that had been miraculously erected had been destroyed. And the Israelites, who had been brought into their own promised land because of that, were now taken captives to the might of the enemy of God's people, Babylon. They were taken in change out of the land of promise to the land of Babylon. Thankfully, God, who is rich in mercy, did not leave things that way. He would once again show himself strong towards his people as he began the process of restoring them to himself and to his purposes for their life. In fact, Jeremiah, the prophet of God, prophesied before they were ever taken captive that when they were taken captive, God already had a promise and a purpose for them. He was already working towards their restoration. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture. You may not have known the context, but God is promising them what he's going to do before they go into captivity because they are going into captivity. But he says to this, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Then, when, whenever whenever you begin to change and then you become restored, you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. You see, they kind of had, they were kind of living with, an, with a, 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 a semblance of God, but they were worshiping idols, they were living worldly lives, and that's not how you live for God. In fact, God himself throughout the prophets, he, will, he considered the nation of Israel to be his bride, and over and over again, he said, you're committing adultery with the world, right? 
And so that's what they were doing. But God says when they return to him, he will, uh, uh, when they, he will find, they will find him when they search with all his heart. He says, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. A lot of the reasons that many of us find ourselves in captivity is because we've drawn away from God. Uh, just as a very simple illustration to help you with that. Um, you know, many of us before the holidays, uh, we, we, we were doing really good. We were, uh, 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 as far as our weight is concerned, you know, we're, we're taking care of ourselves. And then all of a sudden, here come the holidays. And, uh, oh, man, I want to try a little bit of that turkey. That's good. No problem with the turkey. But, oh, look at all the desserts. I'll just have a little dessert. I have a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, a little bit there, a little bit there. And the next thing you know, uh, it, here comes January, and you've gained 15 pounds. <laughs> right? And then... It's January, and you say, okay, well, I got to do better. But then that day, somebody comes over, and they bring over a piece of pie to welcome, you know, thank you for coming. And what happens? Your diet goes out the window. And, and basically, you begin a cycle of just going into, a, the, the, you know, just going into the captivity that you, you, you began uh, uh, during the holidays, you know. And you're like, man, I need to get back to, to this. I need to get back to that. But two years later... How did I get here? And see, that's what's happened with the Israelites. They just began to gradually go away, go away, go away. And the next thing you know, they've gained 300 pounds. And they're going into captivity. They're going to have surgery. They've got to have all these things, right? How did I get here? It's because of our own lusts, our own unwillingness to do what God is wanting us to do. And I will bring you to the place from which I carried you away, Cap. But God is saying in the midst of all that, I can heal you. I can deliver you. It's my will for your life, wherever you're at. Now, that's just kind of a metaphor for the sins that we find ourselves engrossed in as a people. How did I get here? How did I get here, you know, in the middle of the night shooting a needle in my arm? How did I get here, you know, living in the place where I'm living and lose, lost my family, losing my job? How did I get here, you know, going to the doctor and getting a report that I've got uh, COPD because I couldn't stop uh, drinking? How did I get here, you know, I've got cancer of this? How did I get here? Because we allowed ourselves to fall away from God and listen to the voice of the enemy just like with Eve. The enemy comes along and says, come on, it's not going to hurt you. Just take a little bite and stupid us. We believe the lie. And we take a bite, and we get engrossed in pornography, we get engrossed in drugs, we get engrossed in adultery, we get engrossed in all these things. God will never take me back. God is just telling you right here, I can restore you. I can heal you. If you want God... You want what God has. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. If you're listening to the sound of my voice, the Spirit of God is saying, you can be restored. You can be healed. God can do a work in your life. And where you end up is not where you are right now because God is good. Amen? But God begins the process of restoration with the sending forth of his people out of the land of captivity and back into the land of promise. Now, this time it's not from Egypt to the land of Israel. It's from Babylon. They're already his people. Now, they're, they're in Babylon because of their sins, their iniquities, their rebellion. But God is now going to bring them back to the land of Israel. Ezra 1, 1 through 4, Who is among you, all his people? May his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And so what we saw last week is that in the Scriptures that their mission, their directive was to go back to Jerusalem, and in that city they were to rebuild the house of the Lord God of Israel. It had already been well built once, but it had been torn down, but now it's supposed to be rebuild it. But unfortunately, one thing you may not realize is there was a quite a few people that went back, but I don't think if it was even an inkling of the amount of people that lived in Babylon. Not even an inkling. See, what happened, the people of God that were taken to Babylon, they got comfortable in Babylon. They liked Babylon. They wanted to live in Babylon. They didn't want to go back to the land of Israel. They didn't want to go back to the land of promise. Somehow they lost that sense of who they were. 
But to the ones that did go back, they had a purpose. They had a mission to rebuild the house of God. Not all went back, but the ones that did, when they arrived, the first thing they did was to rebuild the altar. Remember, we talked about that last week. What did the altar represent? Well, basically, chiefly, the altar is a place of sacrifice. It is a place where the Israelites brought their substitute offerings on behalf of their sins and transgressions and is the place where God met with them, accepted their sacrifice, and because of it, where reconciliation is established. At the altar is where restoration takes place in the relationship between us and God. Because the Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. We're all separated from God. Well, how do we get restored with God? It's at the place of sacrifice, but not a sacrifice that you make. It's a sacrifice that was made by God, by His Son, through His life, death, burial, and resurrection on your behalf. In the Bible, as we said before, at the place of sacrifice, whenever the sacrifice was made, the fire of God fell. Now, we don't always realize that that light and fire in biblical times were the same. To us, light is different from fire. But to them, light was fire. Right? So 1 John 1 and 5, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. Remember, light and fire are the same. And in him is no darkness at all. So when the fire of God fell and consumed the sacrifice, it was a visible demonstration of the presence of God manifesting to to his people in his acceptance of the sacrifice. In short, through the sacrifices, the way was prepared for God's presence to come. Now let's get to today. What are we going to talk about today? Restoring the temple. What they had restored so far was the altar, but the altar was not the temple. It was part of the temple. It wasn't all the temple. Sometimes as people, we get comfortable just restoring the relationship. Okay, God, we're good now. You and I are good. I'm going to heaven when I die. That's all that matters. Well, until you get saved, that's all that matters. But that's just the starting place. It's not the beginning. I mean, it's not the end. It's kind of like going to the Olympics and say, man, I got here, and then when the, when the gun goes off, you just sit down at the, at the starting blocks and say, man, I'm just so glad I'm here right? But that's not why you're there. Why you're there is to run the race. Why you're there is to complete that which you've been sent to do. And the reason that God saves us is not to just sit down and say, man, I'm so glad I'm here. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. We want to enjoy our salvation. But you just began the race when you got saved. In Ezra 1, 2 through 4, as we said before, Cyrus commanded that the Israelites would go and build a house for the Lord in Jerusalem. Now, at the very beginning, last week, we focused on the initial rebuilding of the altar, and the altar was simply the first stage, however, of the mission. The mission was uh, these first settlers were charged with was to rebuild the temple. Though they began to rebuild the temple, what you may not realize is that it was a process to do it because there's an enemy trying to prevent them from doing what God has called them to do. And I want you to know it's the same today. There is an enemy that wants to prevent us from doing what God wants us to do. How does he prevent us? Well, one way he can prevent us, if you go to Matthew 13, it talked about the seeds and the soil, and you have good seed that's planted, but before you get to the good seed, you have seed that's, that rests on hard hearts, and because the hearts are hard, the seed can't penetrate the soil, and so there's no fruit that comes out of it. And then you have rocky soil. And what is rocky soil? Well, the seed can penetrate the rocky soil, but it can't put down any any roots. The reason it can't put down any roots is because there's rocks preventing from those roots taking taking effect. And that's one of the things that, that Simeon helps us. It helps us to remove the stones because we're the soil so that the Word of God can grow deep. And then when affliction comes, and I want you to know that as a Christian, you're always going to have to face affliction. Not everybody's going to be happy with what you've chosen. Not everything's going to go good with you because you've chosen to follow the Lord. You're going to face storms and trials and afflictions. But you know what? If you don't have deep roots, you're going to, you're going to fall away. But if your roots go deep, then you're going to be able to overcome the afflictions that come your way. 
But if that doesn't work, if it's not hard, hard, hard going, if it's not affliction that oftentimes keeps us from following after the Lord, then the enemy comes in with the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. What does that mean? We get busy doing life and we forget about the Lord. We get busy enjoying uh, uh, the pies and the cakes and we forget that we, we have a battle with diabetes going on. Ouch. You know what I'm saying? And so we stop doing what we needed to do and that's what I'm saying. We find ourselves in Babylon in captivity and wonder how we got there because we, we, we stop uh, 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 allowing God to be the focus and the center and, and the, the, the purpose through which and through which and to which we live. Other things distract us. Oh, they offered me a shift on Sunday. Well, that's fine. No problem. Take the shift. But then they offer me another one next week, another one next week, and another one next week. And what begins to happen? Well, I like the paycheck, so I just keep, now I sign up for shifts. I want to, hey, we can get a bigger house. We can get a bigger boat. We can get this. We can get that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but if that is costing you your relationship with God and fellowship with the people of God, then the enemy through the cares of this world has drawn you astray. I, I told, I've told you, I may have told you last week, when I got saved, um, I used to play soccer, and soccer was on Sunday mornings. It's not that I was good. It's just younger than most of the team, and so when you're younger, you can usually run faster than older people. Yeah, sometimes. So they didn't want me to quit, but I was in my prayer closet, and the Lord said, I want you to go to church on Sunday mornings. Well, I knew what that meant. That means I couldn't play soccer anymore because when was soccer on Sunday mornings? So I went, to the, I, I went to them. I said, I can't play anymore. Why? Because I want to go to church. Oh, you don't have to go to church on Sunday morning. You can go to church on Sunday night. You can go to church on Wednesday night. You can do all these kind of things. Say the people that don't go to church. Right? But that's not what the Lord asked me to do. The Lord asked me to go to church on Sunday morning. And doesn't the Bible say, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Right? It's not trying to find a way to get to do what I want to do. I should be trying to find a way to do what he wants me to do. And if that's what he asks of me, it doesn't matter what anybody else wants me to do. What matters is what the Lord, and he, he wasn't, if I didn't do it, it's not like I was going to go to hell. It's just that for me to grow, I have to learn how to submit and, and get rid of things that are preventing me from doing his will. His will has to be the priority. Amen? So then what happened was uh, they, they, the Israelites, you thought I lost, I forgot where I was going, but I didn't. The Israelites, through 20 years of, uh, of, uh, of, of being in the land, trying to rebuild the temple, kept being harassed by the enemy, kept being harassed by the enemy, and the enemy finally got to a place where they stopped building. Oh, God must not want me to build because it's too hard. Right? I want to tell you something about modern-day Christianity. Modern-day Christianity measures whether or not they're going to do something for God by whether it's hard. If it's hard, it's not God. If it's easy, it's God. And I want you to know that I've been living my life for God. I got saved in 1985. You do the math. All right? And I want you to know almost anything that I've done in life has not been easy. It has been hard. Because it seems like whatever the Lord leads me to do, the enemy's there to challenge me, to hinder me, to try to get me to stop doing whatever it is that God's called me to do. It, it, you cannot measure what God is calling you to do by whether or not it's easy or not. I mean, well, I want to go to church this morning, but it's sprinkling and it's going to mess my hair up. I like to take a stand for God, but if I post it on Facebook, they're going to unfriend me. Please. Right? I want to tell you something. The enemy will do anything he can to keep you from serving God. you got to have, as they used to say in old-time Pentecost, not that I'm real old, but I remember the, old, the people that were really real old, they used to say this. you got to have a made-up mind that I'm going to do God's will and I'm going to serve God. Uh, whatever else has to go, I'm going to do God's will in my life. Right? 
So here they're being harassed by the enemy, and after 20 years, God begins to speak to them through the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. In Ezra 5, 1 through 2, the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, the prophets of God, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, who was over them, and Zerubbabel, who was the head leader at the time, he was one of the descendants of David, and Shealtiel and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, rose up, and they began to build, and it should say, to understand, uh, we should say it this way, and began to build again, because they had been stopped for 20 years, the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, helping them. Now, if you want to know what they were prophesying, if you go to the book of Haggai, and I happen to have that here, Haggai 1, 7 through 9, Haggai, uh, the Lord through the prophet Haggai was saying to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it. Be glorified, says the Lord. You, in your own lives, you look for much, but it came to little. And when you brought it home, it blew away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because my house, of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to build your own house. See, what happens is, we start to build up our own lives, our own purposes, what we want, and we neglect the house of God, right? Because it's too hard. And what we need to realize is that God is not okay with that. That's why he's sending the prophets, Haggai and, uh, and, and the other prophets, to prophesy and say, you need to get back to doing uh, what I sent you to do, which is rebuild the temple, And the reason I'm focusing on this is because of the importance God gives to rebuilding the temple of God, to rebuilding the house of God. The blessings of God on his people were actually tied to their priorities in putting the house of God, the kingdom of God first in their lives. As we were reading before, Haggai 1, 9 through 11, you look for much, but it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and on the mountains and on the grain and the new wine, on the oil, on whatever uh, the ground brings forth, on men and on livestock and on the labor of your hands. So what we want to learn from this is that rebuilding the temple was a big deal to God then, and it's my belief that it's still a big deal to God today. Now, I'm not talking about a physical temple that was set in Jerusalem. I'm talking about the church. The church is the house of God. Depending on your translation, it'll call it the temple of God. But the temple of God is the house of God. The church of today is the New Testament equivalent of the temple back then. The presence of God manifested in the physical temple the Jews built, but today the presence of God manifests in his people in the church and the people that God the Holy Spirit is building. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Think about that. How many of y'all are born again Christians? Okay, everybody else that didn't raise your hand, when I call them an altar call at the end of the service, I want you to raise that hand. Let's try it again. How many of y'all are born again Christians? All right. Do you know that you didn't just say a prayer? You didn't just agree to join an institution. Do you know that a miraculous uh, 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 work of God took place in your life and you were born again, and when you were born again, God saved you, forgave you, healed you, made you whole, so that, not finished yet, hold on to those applause, so that God could take up residence inside of you. Now you can give God glory. Turn to somebody that that, that raised their hand (laughs) and say, God lives inside of you. I mean, we could just stop there, meditate on that for a couple of thousand. God lives inside of us. For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you, and this is plural, you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people.
Now let's push this type a little bit farther. You might be thinking that getting people saved is the equivalent of building up the temple or building up the church. Well, it's the first step, but it's not the end. Remember, rebuilding the altar was part of rebuilding the temple. It was the first stage in the process. In the same way, getting people saved is paramount in building the temple, but it's simply the first stage in the process. Without minimizing its importance, there's more to building the church than just getting people saved. Some of y'all thought I might get hit by a thunderbolt there, but. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10. Come unto him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. He's talking about the church, individual members of the church, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, we're talking about the Lord, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, now we're talking about people that get saved, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, depending on whether you believe in him or not. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you who believe are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous life, who were once not a people, but now you're the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Do you see here that it says that Jesus was the chief cornerstone? He is the stone around which the other stones are to be measured against and laid together to build the structure. Uh Uh-oh, lost you. How is the structure built? By the other living stones being laid next to the chief cornerstone. You see, we want to measure how good we are by measuring one stone with another stone. But you'll ne- that's never the way you're supposed to be measured up to Jesus Christ. And how do you get measured up to Jesus Christ? By the work that he did on the cross of Calvary. You might you can lay you next to him, and you say, well, I don't see. Let me give you a little uh, picture of how construction techniques worked back then, all right? So what they would do, they didn't, I'm sure they leveled and did all that, but the way they did things is they found a perfect stone, perfect 90-degree stone, perfect level. They set it in place, and then all the other stones would have to match up with that stone. So the the key to build a solid structure is always the foundation. You have to have it level. You have to have it true. You have to have, but in order to do that, you have to have the perfect stone. There is one perfect stone, and his name is Jesus. So what they would do then is they would take the other stones, which are you and I, and measure it against Jesus Christ. And if it was fit to be put in the temple, and how do you become fit to be put in the temple? You get saved. He makes you fit. He makes you right. Right? So when that happens, then what happens is he puts you together with other stones that have been measured up against Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, The problem with today, I think I'm running off uh, uh, my notes a little bit farther than what I need to be, but the problem with today is many people say, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. It's because, and I love you, and I mean this in the very most sincerest form of the word, you believed a lie or you're ignorant. Because the Bible doesn't teach that. You see, you yourself are a temple of God, but you're not the temple of God. God's temple is the people of God. And you can't build a temple without a bunch of people. You, without stones, you can't have one stone and have a temple. You've got to have a multitude of stones all being built together. The problem is we don't want to be put next to people. Uh, uh, we want to be on our own or we don't want to be put next to that person. We want to be, we want to be put this, and, and the Lord doesn't build that way. See, you're not in control of the process. He's in control of the process. Now, you do have free will. You can say, I don't want to do that. And in no way am I saying that you can't go to heaven and not be part, uh, you know, and and not go to church. I'm not saying that at all. 
That's between you and the Lord. And technically, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What I'm trying to get you to understand is the mission is not just that you get saved and go to heaven when you die. The mission was to rebuild the temple. And the reason to rebuild the temple is so that God's influence can be felt in the world. But if you're not willing to be built together and laid together with other stones, you might get to heaven, but your life and the life of those that God would have you in connection with is going to live a a lower threshold than what God wants for you because you won't be able to accomplish it unless you're yoked together with other people. One can put a thousand, well, I'm one, I can put a thousand, praise the Lord. Yeah, but what happens if you're in a battle with tens of thousands? If you're in a battle with hundreds of thousands, what do you have to do? Well, uh, the Bible says two can put 10,000 to flight. In order to, to, to accomplish what God wants us to do, we have to die to ourselves and be yoked together with other people. The problem is when we get yoked to, uh, with, together with other people, that's when we realize that it's uncomfortable because I got a place that's got to be chiseled off. Or they got a place in them that has got to be chiseled up. But man, I'm putting together and they got a sharp edge. And man, they just, it irritates me. It bugs me. I don't want, I'm quitting church. And then we create theologies and doctrines to basically do what we want. But not do the will of God. Right? So the Bible says in Ephesians 4, uh, uh, 11 through 16, he himself gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the, not individual saint, but the equipping of the saints, plural. For what? So the saints, the church, not the pastor, not the staff, the staff is to equip the church so the church, the people of God can do the work of ministry. No, no. Hey, that's what the word of God teaches. When you have the Word of God teaching you something, if what you think doesn't match up to the Word of God, you don't throw out the Word of God. You throw out what you think. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself in the knowledge of God. Where do those imaginations exist in our thinking? Be not conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, so uh, for, the, uh, f- for the saints to do the work of the ministry so that the saints can build up the body of Christ. Who's supposed to do the work of the ministry? Turn to somebody and say, I think he's talking to you. Who's supposed to build up the body of Christ? Turn to someone and say, I think he's talking to you. How long is this supposed to continue? Till we get a new pastor. No. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man. That word perfect means mature. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, Christ is the fullness of God. It's what we aspire to. He's not just God. He's our example. And we're like, we have to grow up unto him until the body reflects the head. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love. And by the way, the mortar that holds the stones together is love. Love covers a multitude of sins. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into all things unto him who is the head. We grow up together. See, it's a different metaphor. One of them was a metaphor of stones building a house. This is a metaphor of joints and marrow and and tendons and, and coming together to build up the body. But the body doesn't get built up unless, unless every member supplies what it has. Let's keep on reading. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. So in other words, for the body to become all it's supposed to be, you've got to become a giver. You know what church today, church culturally today, is not about people coming to give, but about people coming to get. What are you going to give me? You're going to give me a good sermon? Then I'll come to your church. You're going to give me stuff? Then I'll come to your church. You're going to give me influence? Then I'm going to come to your church. Well, you know what? 
that can work and it can build a good structure and a good organization, you know, but it's not building up the body because a body is grow, it grows by what each every member gives. Right? Jesus didn't come technically to get. He came to give. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, and we're supposed to become like him. Not self-indulgent, but self-sacrificing. Amen? So later on in the same letter to the Ephesians, Paul writes to the church in Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, finally, my brethren, and he's talking to the church, not individually, but corporately. My brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. Oh, praise God, I put on my armor every day. You know, I put on my, 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 my belt of truth. I put on my, 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 my feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I put on my breastplate of righteousness. I do all, I'm dressed. But it doesn't say individually, it says the church. That's a good thing for you to do, but one soldier is not going to do much against an army. You got to have all of us dressed together with singleness of mind, singleness of purpose to be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Put on the whole armor of God, the church. Well, we, we, we're going to have a hole in our ranks here. Why? Because they're not coming to church. They're missing. Well, we're going to have to do the best that we can, but imagine what we could do if there was whoever's supposed to be there was here. Right? That you may be able to stand against the walls of the devil. See, Paul's not talking to the individual. The context of the instruction is the church as a whole. Finally, my brethren, you, plural, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Oh, how important it is that to us who live in such an individualistic society that we understand God's desire is not that we individually live out our Christian life. Today we get saved and we believe that, that you know, we can then live without the church. In Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, it says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. But we keep wanting to just consider ourselves. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. You can assemble and not be together. God doesn't want you just to be assembled. He wants you to be together. Right? And you know, that's what they do whenever they go to boot camp. They're not just trying to get you there. They're trying to get you to become one cohesive unit. As is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much more as, you're, as the day approaches. You know, we're closer to that day than they were before. So we need to be about doing the Father's business. What we're learning about, as we, as we conclude what we're learning about here today, what we are learning about the restoration of God's people is that it's not simply about getting the altar going. God's priority is that his house would be built up, and that can't happen unless we are joined together. Now listen, if you're new here, you don't have to come here, but you need to be a part of a body. But I will tell you as a pastor, we would love you here. I hope you've already felt the love of the body that's here. We would love to have you. But if this is not the place where you want to be and it's not your fit or whatever, that's fine, no problem. But don't fall into the trap of saying, well, I'll just watch online. Online is for those that can't get to somewhere, that are working or they, they want to watch it later or they're in some place where they have no church around them, but we got churches on every corner. That's not for you. For you, it's to be a part of a body, to be somewhere where you're physically joined, where someone will miss you if you're not there, where someone will say, hey, man, you got to work on that. You got to work on that point because that hurts. Where you got to get worked on and they got to get worked on because you got two people living together, not always harmoniously, but you got you to you gotta learn how to love in order to do that. Right? The Bible says in Acts 2, 44 through 47. You know, oh, oh, let me say this. God's priority is that his house would be built up, and that can't happen unless we're joined together. It's together that we become the victorious people he paid a price to form. Acts 2, 20, 44 through 47. Now all who believed were together. Oh, that Acts church. I was with part of that Acts church. Well, you couldn't have been if you weren't together. And they weren't just together on Sundays. They wanted to be together all the time. 
And they didn't just give part. They didn't just give 10%. They gave all they had. You still want to be a part of the New Testament church? Now, all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Now, let me, let me just stop there. And Like I said, I'm done. The reason they would sell their stuff to help the others is because they knew them and loved them. If you just come to church with people and you don't know who they are and somebody has a need, you might put something in if they need help. You might do something. But if it's your family, if it's someone that you love, you will do anything you can to help that person. See, that's, that's the kind of church. Why were they selling their goods? Because they knew each other and they loved, and they were on a common mission and a common purpose. And, and helping them was more important than whether or not I have three streaming services. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. How often were they together? Daily. We only ask you to come together twice a week. And breaking bread from house to house. Paul, uh, Marty says, y'all are the most eatenest church I've ever been to. But I don't think so. I think it was the Acts church that was more eatenest than we were. They ate their food with gladness. Well, I don't want this stuff. I don't want it. I want to go so. <laughs> Reminds me of when my kids, you know, we, are, we have so much we're spoiled. Right? I love my kids. Um, I used to uh, 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 say to them, hey, let's go get something to eat when they lived in the house. And they would say, where are we going? It wasn't like, yes, we want to be with you, Dad. We want to have lunch with you. It's like, it's like where are we going? Right? Well, you know, and I got to think, I don't, I'm not a wealthy person. I didn't have a lot of money. I got to pay for three people now because I'm asking about all three girls. And I said, well, we'll probably go somewhere where it's not so expensive. They have Luann played at Luby's. I said, let's go to Luby's. They said, I don't want to go. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't really care about the meal. I want to be with you. Right? And today, I think sometimes we forget about what the priority is. It's about being together and we're worried about the meal. Where are we going? Who's paying? (laughs) And guess what happened because of that? The Lord added to the church daily. They met together daily. You know what? If we meet together weekly, maybe when it's written of us, it'll say he added to the church weekly those who were being saved. So let's, let's wrap this up. And, and, and I, I promise you that I'm wrapping it up because it says conclusion in here. So as we've learned so far, rebuilding the altar was simply the first part of rebuilding the temple. It was the first stage in the process. In the same way, getting people saved, you getting saved, is paramount in building the church, but your salvation, that day of conversion, is not the end. It's just the beginning. There's more to building the church than just getting people saved. God's priority is that his house, his body, would be built up. And we're going to get to why. It's not so that we could just hang out in the house. It's because as the church is built up, we grow into our purpose. And our purpose is to bring his influence into the land, into your job, into your school, into the place where you uh, shop, wherever you go, so that his purposes can invade the land. But it begins by becoming strong in him individually and strong together as the church, right? It's together that we become the victorious people of God that he paid a price for. And through him and through his purposes, through him, his purposes will be accomplished. And I had this thought for some of you that are wondering about what I said. Let's say that as a church, we're getting people saved, but we're not coming together. But God wants his, his kingdom to have influence in the land. But in the land, there is a, a, a power, a principality of suicide, and there has been in this, in this area. Teenagers, a big, big uh, problem with teenagers killing themselves, right? So I'm sorry if this is a little blunt, I, uh, but this, it's been a problem in this area. Or let's say in this area there's a problem with uh, 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 corruption, 
Now, how many of you know in this whole land there's a problem with corruption? I'm sure there's a problem with corruption in this area. Or in this area, there's a problem with, uh, you know, we've got all these uh, uh, different uh, things that are coming up. That, you know, so it's not just us individually. Uh, how do we deal with this stuff? As a church, when we become strong and we begin to realize the power that God has given us, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The authority that he's given to us when we come together, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, rulers. I mean, I can think of some things that are going to try to make their way in, whether it had been abortion. You say, well, that's been dealt with. Well, it's been dealt with on a federal level, but it has to be dealt with here on, an individ- on, a, on a city level where we begin to uh, uh, deal with those things, where we begin to deal with uh, uh, the fentanyl crisis. You know, I believe that we can have a fentanyl-free zone. You say, well, the government, the government. No, you see, we have access to a power that's greater than the government. And a strong church can come together and begin to wield that power through prayer because, like I said, it's not people that's the problem. It's the powers and the principalities and the rulers, and God wants them taken down. And how does it get taken down? By a people that knows their God and does great exploits in the name of his God. But it's not going to happen as an individual. It happens as a church when we come together. We know who we are. We know what God has called us to do. And in his name, united together, we go against these idols and against these powers and in Jesus' name he wants him brought down and we bring him down in his name. We can't even sit together. We have a hard time dealing with one another. Well, they don't believe like I do, so I'm going somewhere else where they believe like I do. Or they don't don't do what I want them to do, so I'm going to go somewhere else where they do what I want. And and the devil comes in to divide and to destroy and and to do all these kind of things. And so as a church, we we don't realize it's an opportunity to to show love, to show mercy, to grow together, to learn how to embrace people. And our, our whole society is being built today around differences. And dividing because of differences. And I want you to know when you come to church, you have every opportunity to divide. You have different races, different genders, different thoughts, different ways of thinking. But it's the Spirit of God and the love of God that glues us together. When the Spirit of God was poured out on the day of Pentecost, all different people from all different places heard them speaking in in, in other tongues and all together in the other language they were praising God. It's the Spirit of God and the love of God that will bind us together. i got to stop. We need one another. We need to build up the body of Christ. We need you. Amen.